Hello, and welcome to four quick SQL tips for data scientists and data analysts. So today we're going to go over some quick SQL syntax as well as a few concepts that should help you improve your SQL. These are just kind of tips and tricks. You'll kind of many of these are just tips and tricks that you will inevitably use at some point. We just figured we'd help speed up the process and let you become familiar with them uh, early. So let's get started. All right, so the first one is using a case statement inside of a sum function. For this example, you'll usually see data scientists and data analysts pick up this concept within the first year or two because you'll usually use it to try to calculate like the percentage of nulls for a specific column without having to join to the same table twice. Uh, so let me show you what I mean. Let's go over to our query editor in Popsicle. All right, so we have two queries here to kind of show you two different ways to calculate. Basically, in this case, it's the percentage um, of claims that are over $500. But this could also be where a column is null. You might be wanting to count that if you like left join to a column and then say, you know, in this where clause, uh, instead saying, you know, where that column is null, or it could, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can use this. But if you'll notice, we have a join, basically it's joining just to basically a cross join where we've said on one equals one since there's only one column in both of these. So when we join this, you know, it'll give us the percentage of columns in this case over $500, you know, cause we've got this count here, which will give us the total count for this entire claims table. Whereas this sub query is only the count for where there is more than $500 per claim. It's the same table, right? We've hit claims twice to get two different values. To avoid hitting this table twice, we can just use a case statement like we do here, case, uh, when, right? Like here you see this case statement. And instead of using this where clause here, we can use it here for this when statement and then use then one else zero to basically say when to sum. And that will give you the count of all of the claims that are greater than $500. Again, this could also be used for cases where you're left joining, possibly, you know, you might, you might have been left joining this to a different table and you want to figure out how many of those columns maybe didn't have an ID or something because you're using a database that, that doesn't have foreign keys or something where you might be wanting to check um, if there are issues like that. You could just use this sum case statement and that avoids you having to hit the table twice. So if we run this basically, you'll see that it's the same answer. And so that's kind of your first quick tip. Again, that's it's much shorter. From a SQL standpoint, and it's also uh, much better from a performance standpoint because you're only doing one table scan. All right, let's now go to the next tip. All right, so for this one, we actually did a video on this one, a whole longer video where we talked about kind of the reasons why and you know why you shouldn't average averages, but we wanted to put it here in this quick tips just in case you missed it. So let's kind of look into why we shouldn't average averages. Um, again, we're gonna go to back to Pop SQL. All right, so for this example, uh, we're going to use this first table here where it says select all from uh, aggregate patients. And this represents a table where we've already calculated the average uh, visits per patient as well as the average cost per patient by county and by age range. Now, what might happen is you might have a director ask for the average by just county. And, you know, it might be tempting to just average your average. We've definitely seen some people, you know, just run an average of an average here. So exact what you'll see here, right? We're just taking an average of average uh, visits per patient and taking an average of average cost per patient. We run this. And honestly, if we look at the numbers and compare them to the previous ones, they actually look like they kind of make sense. Uh, you know, you should always kind of do a sniff check when it comes to numbers. And so this can kind of be misleading because it's like, well, these numbers kind of look logical. They don't really seem to stray away too far from our previous averages. So I think this is why some people will be tempted to just average and average, but you should actually be just rerunning this number similar to the way we're kind of doing here below. So if you see here below, uh, in order to get average total visits, we are counting the distinct total patients uh, as well as just getting a count of each of the claims so that, or visits, so that will give you an average of the visits. And then we're summing claim costs and again, dividing it by the total patients. So if we were to compare these numbers, um, we actually get a pretty different output. Let me order, order this a little bit. So these first two, uh, well actually mobile and grace are both the same because they only really have one example. But if we look at King County, this is where the difference is kind of big. So average visits kind of is deceptive because it's, it's not that different, right? In many ways, this is why I think a lot of people get tempted to use average of averages because sometimes they stay very similar, but other times they don't. And I think we see that more in claim costs here where the average claim cost per patient 
there's about a 10%, 12% difference, you know, about $80 between from the, the correct way, which is $622, if you scroll over, uh, and the average of averages, which is $564. So in this case, we're going to be underreporting by about $80 per patient, which is significant uh, when you think about you know, scaling that up to thousands and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patients. So this is a really kind of great example of why average of averages don't work, um, despite the fact that they seem like they should. Uh, in our previous video, we talked about, you know, the SKU and we go through a crazy example where it will make even more sense. So if you're interested in watching that, I'll try to link that below. But this is kind of all I was going to cover for this quick tip because we're kind of going to go through this and try to make this a 10 minute video. All right, next we're going to talk about learning how to use the lag and lead functions. Um, so for those of you that are maybe familiar with row number or rank, these are kind of similar. They're also analytic or also could be called window functions. So let's kind of take a look at how they work and what they do. All right, so in this case, we're just using the lag function, but lag and lead, but the lead is basically kind of the opposite of lag. So lag basically will get you the previous value for whatever you partition by. So in this case, we're gonna get the previous claim date for a patient ordered by claim date. So we're, you could order it by something else. So if you were to, for some reason, instead order it by maybe claim cost, then you would just get the claim date of the cost that was essentially cheaper than the claim date of the cost that you're currently looking at. So let me show you what this means because that's obviously confusing and kind of a mouthful. All right, so if we run this, what you'll see is we have claim date. This is the actual claim date for the claim. Uh, and then for this example, we have previous claim date. So, so for a claim date, 2020-01, there's no previous claim date because it's the first claim date. But for claim date 2001-06, the previous claim date was 2020-01-01 because that's this column here. And so forth for 2020-02-06, well, the previous column was over here. And so this gives you the very previous value. Uh, we also did that with claim cost. So we got the previous claim cost. So uh, $100 was the first claim cost, null because there's no other claim cost, uh, $100 here because the first claim cost was $100. So for our current claim, it's $200, but for our previous claim, it was 100. And then same thing can be said here. Uh, for 2020-06, the claim is 550, but in 2021-06, it was 200. And so that's kind of what the lag and lead do. Uh, you know, you might use that, for example, to do something like we're gonna do here, which is just to calculate how many days are in between each of the values. So that might be something you're interested in doing. So in this case, we in this first claim, it's null because there's no difference, but we have five days difference between 0101 uh, and 0106, right? That makes sense, five days, and then 31 days between these two days. And then again, that kind of continues down here where there's eight days between 01 uh, and 09, and then 23 days between 09 and 01. And that kind of goes on. And this is especially helpful, I think, uh, with patients data because you're often trying to predict, you know, um, how often people are being readmitted. Uh, this is also very helpful when you're trying to figure out how often maybe users visit your website. Um, so this is a very helpful kind of SQL trick. All right, and now for our very final SQL tip. So for our final uh, SQL tip, we're going to be going over, I think, a little more of a concept and less of a tip, which is unnesting and working with arrays and maps. Uh, so arrays and maps are basically two different data types that can be found in some uh, SQL engines and databases like Presto, uh, or Postgres. So you can use these to kind of store data that's a little more unstructured often. Um, so let me let me kind of show you what exactly a map and an array look like. So for those of you who maybe don't know what arrays and maps are, you kind of get a general idea what they are. All right, so what are a map and an array? So in Postgres, which is what we're using, uh, I've got user interests set up as an array. So what you'll see is um, they store it with curly brackets, but you can also do uh, square brackets, it just depends on how you set it up. What you'll notice is it's basically a comma separated list of things. So in this case, it's user interests, and it can be, in this case, any size. Um, I didn't set a specific size. So, you know, in this case, the list is basketball, comics, movies for interest. And that's basically all an array is. It's kind of just a list separated by typically a comma. It could be integers instead of strings. There's also things called like 2D arrays, but I'm not going to go too much into it. We're going to kind of go how you can use it here in a second after I explain maps. And so next, to explain what a map is, a map is essentially a key value pair. So what that means is there's a key, um, in this case, like DOB, which is date of birth, is acting as the key, and then a value that's connected to that key. In this case, you know, it's the date of birth, which is 200101. So the key is date of birth, and the value that, rep that is basically represented by that key is 200101. 
Similarly, we also have another key here, which is friend IDs. And the values is kind of a list of IDs. But now let's say you want to actually like analyze that data, right? Like you don't just want to have it kind of trapped here. You know, you can't really group correctly here. You know, if you want to like group on user interests, um, that'd be very difficult in this method because everything's what we would reference as denormalized, essentially. It's all kind of in one column. Well, let's start with how do you access some of these values uh, in the array specifically. So one way you can do that is just by referencing it uh, with a curly bracket. So you can do the column, which again is user interests, uh, and then use a square bracket, sorry, not curly bracket. And then the number maybe of the specific column that you want. Now this is kind of uh, hacky in the sense that I'm calling out a very specific number. So if we just pull this out, position two is essentially what we're looking at. So this is pulling from what we reference as position two. Uh, if you're using a normal array, it will start at zero for positions and then go forward. But in this case, it starts at one. So the second position is essentially comics. Uh, if we, so if you look down here, it's comics, driving, reading. So again, comics, driving, reading. And so that's how you pull out a specific position in an array. Another thing you might want to do with an array is figure out how long it is. So you might use uh, array length which array length for those of you who may be familiar with Excel, it's very similar to you know, calculating the length of a string, except for now we're just trying to count how, how many elements there are in an array. The comma one is basically to tell which dimension of the array you're counting. Uh, in this case, it's just one because you don't have a two dimensional array. So if you're to count this, or it's three, three, and two. So if we were to actually relook at this, let's pull this column again, or this table again. Right, you have three values here, three values here, and two values here. So it counts you uh, all the various counts. Finally, you can unnest this. So unnesting this uh, will give you all the values. So that way, you know, if you wanted to count, you know, if you want to figure out who has similar interests, you could do that easily. So let's pull this out. So what you'll see is this has username and then the unnested column here. You could name this obviously something better, but that way you can now kind of uh, figure out who has similar interests and it's easy to access that information now. All right, one more array tip. Sometimes what you wanna do is figure out if a certain value exists in an array. So in this case, let's say you were interested in figuring out if reading exists in an array, like if reading, in this case, user interest exists, uh, you can use array position and it will tell you where in the array that value exists. So if we run this, remember we had two users that actually had reading. So one was in position three, one was in position two. And then why that might be interesting is you might want to calculate, you know, uh, the percentage or something like that. So again, you can use that sum hint we used earlier where you sum a case statement uh, just to get a count of the total users that have reading as an interest. All right, one more thing before we go, I'm going to cover the map. So if you remember, uh, there's a map that basically has a key, so DOB and a value, 2001.01. And you might want to pull that information out. The question becomes how? you're essentially kind of joining this table to this other value to user data uh, using this function called JSON uh, each text. And then you can reference the key and the value as key and value. So if we pull this out, for example, I'll show you what this looks like. Here's key, here's value. Again, date of birth, 2020.01, friend IDs, it gives you the list, again, date of birth, et cetera. And you'll see it's broken down by each username. Uh, and so that's one way you can pull out this information and then later on put this probably more into a column or fashion rather than having this weird key value structure. So that's my last kind of just tip or hint that you guys are going to be using as a data scientist or possibly a data analyst. It really depends on, you know, if you've got data engineers, BI developers, how your data warehouse is structured. Uh, I did the whole key value and map because more and more data warehouses I'm seeing have this kind of unstructured format to their data. So I wanted to make sure you kind of had some familiarity with it, that it's possible. Uh, and there's a ton of stuff you can do. I'll put some links below for how to further use uh, arrays and maps, because I think that's definitely the trickiest. Hopefully, personally, there aren't too many of these in your data warehouse, because they've become very difficult, I think, for analysts to utilize. So with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, I hope you join us again. Again, we're going to keep kind of doing SQL tips as well as you know, everything from data science, data analytics, uh, automation, and we really like to, you know, have you come again. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe so that we can keep, you know, getting noticed by algorithm. And for now, we'll see you next time.